Hello chemists, this is Ms. Placino and you are watching a tutorial on significant figures. Uh, this topic really tends to elude a lot of students, but it's very important, especially when you're working in the lab. Uh, so in this video, we're going to cover the importance of sig figs, measuring to the correct number of significant figures, which is really important for a lab course, counting sig figs, so once you have your measurement, determining how many of those digits are actually significant, and finally, how to use sig figs in calculations. All right, so let's get started. Uh, you've probably seen these dartboard pictures before, and hopefully you remember that they are in relation to precision and accuracy. And usually when we're talking about those two topics, you're talking about the accuracy and precision of your results. So just to quickly review, when we're talking about accuracy, you're really looking at how close your value is to the accepted or the correct value. Basically, did you do it right? When you talk about precision of results, you're talking about repeatability. Uh, so really how close your results are to one another. Were you able to be consistent? Uh, so if you could take a minute, pause the video, and see if you can assess the location of the darts in terms of precision and accuracy. All right, on this first dartboard, you are precise, but not very accurate. Uh, this is usually the result of having a really consistent, hopefully consistently good technique in the lab, but it might be an indication that there's a fundamental problem with the procedure. Uh, we've got the opposite of that on dartboard two. Um, you haven't been very precise at all. The data is kind of all over the place, but it does generally cluster around the right answer. Uh, this is something that can usually be corrected by kind of fixing your lab technique and being a little bit more careful. Dartboard three is worst case scenario. You're not precise, nor are you accurate. Um, so your data is kind of just a mess. And this last start board, this is pretty ideal, where not only are you getting the correct answer, but you're able to repeat that time and time again. Uh, so hopefully over the course of the semester, your data starts looking more like dartboard four and not so much like any of the other ones, especially that third dartboard. Uh, where sig figs come into play is not when we're talking about precision and accuracy in terms of results, but when we're looking at instrumentation. So when we're talking about instrument accuracy, we're looking at the ability of an instrument to measure correctly. Um, in other words, has it been calibrated correctly? When you take a 100 gram mass and you place it on the electronic scale, does the scale read 100 grams? If it does, it is calibrated. If it doesn't, it is not calibrated. Sig figs are a big deal with instrument precision. Uh, this is not how many times the instrument will give you the same mass reading for the same sample. We're talking about precision for instruments. We're talking about the smallest possible increment that can be measured by the instrument. So let's look at an example. Say you've got these four electronic scales. You've got the sample, place it on the balance or the scale, you get 112 grams. On the next one, you get 112.4 grams. The third scale gives you 112.43 grams. And the last scale gives you 112.432 grams. Now all of these instruments are well, at least equally accurate. We don't know if that thing actually weighs 112 grams, but all four of these are in agreement. Uh, precision has to do with the smallest increment measured by the instrument. Um, so for example, on that first scale, it measures to the ones place, the second, the tens place, the third one, the hundreds place, and the last one, the thousands place. So let's take a little bit more time to talk about instrument precision. We've got those same four mass readings again. Uh, so when you're looking at that first or the leftmost scale, uh, the instrument knows that the mass is between 110 and 120 grams. Um, where it got the two from is that it estimated it. So we say that the, the ones place is uncertain. On the next scale, we see that the mass is between 112 and 113 grams. The instrument estimated the 0.4 grams. So the tenths place is uncertain. You're probably seeing a pattern by now. Third scale, the mass is between 112.4 and 112.5 grams. The instrument estimated the hundreds place, so it is uncertain. And finally, on that last scale, the mass is between 112.43 and 112.44 grams, so the thousands place was uncertain. Hopefully you notice the pattern that in each of those measurements, on each of those scales, it's the last digit that is uncertain. So it has been guessed. In this case, this has uh, been guessed by the instrument automatically. 
So really the importance of significant figures are that they help us communicate the precision of the instrument used. The more decimal places uh, after the decimal point, the more um, precise an instrument is. If you look at the picture, that is an analytical balance and it actually measures out to the hundred thousandths pl uh, place. So that's an extremely precise, very sensitive piece of instrumentation and as a result is also very expensive. All right, let's move on to measuring and significant figures. And this is something that is going to play a huge role in the lab. So we know to convey the precision of the instrument, we have to express a measurement to the correct number of significant figures. Uh, when you're working with digital instrumentation, this is done automatically. Uh, so based on what we just talked about, with this digital thermometer, the thermometer knows the temperature of the sample is somewhere between 31 and 32 degrees Celsius. It estimated the 0.4. When you're working with analog instruments, uh, something like an old school thermometer or a uh, graduated cylinder, you have to make this estimation manually. You have to go through and see where the, uh, the liquid level is and you've got to make the judgment call. So let's talk a little bit more about the proper measuring technique. All right, so we've got these two rulers. You want to measure as far as the instrument allows. We'll look at ruler one. Uh, so when we say measure as far as the instrument allows, we're talking about measure to um, basically whatever the, the smallest increment is, in this case, on our ruler. Uh, so I can see that on ruler one, the smallest thing I can measure is a centimeter. And I can say with 100% confidence that the height of that paperclip is somewhere between two and three centimeters. I need to estimate the next place. Uh, so in the case of ruler number one, the next place would be the tenths place. So I'm going to look at that and I say it's uh, 2.8. Finally, include the appropriate units. So we're talking about a ruler. It's clearly labeled on the ruler. So I have to get 2.8 centimeters. Maybe you look at that and you see 2.7 centimeters. That's fine. 2.9 centimeters. That's fine as well. The important part is that the tenths place has been estimated. You're communicating that that digit is uncertain. Pause the video, see if you can figure out ruler two. So first thing you want to do is measure as far as the instrument allows. We can go to the tenths place. So I see that the paper clip is between 2.7 and 2.8 centimeters. Estimate the next place, so the hundredths place. Um, I'm going to call that 2.71 centimeters. Again, you might not agree with that last uh, place. You might get something different in the hundredths place. That's fine, as long as the hundredths place is present. This is a very important concept and one that will be used throughout the semester. So pause the video, take a uh, minute to go through and figure out the uh, measurements for these five different pieces of instrumentation and take an educated guess on what the unit should be. All right, first up we've got a beaker, so we're measuring volume. I'm going to go out on a limb and assume this is in milliliters. I can say with 100% confidence that the volume in the beaker is somewhere between 20 and 30 milliliters. I'm going to guess 28. So my ones place has been estimated. It is uncertain. Uh, next up, we've got a thermometer, most likely, and I ended up with a measurement of 0.29 degrees Celsius. For the third one, uh, that looks like it's a burette. I get 10.58 milliliters. Uh, if you're reading it like a graduated cylinder and you came up with like 11.42 milliliters, be careful. Um, on a burette, volume is actually measured uh, from top to bottom, not the other way around. Uh, the important thing here is that you've got it estimated to the hundredths place. Fourth instrument, ruler, most likely centimeters. I get 5.99 centimeters. If you think this is six centimeters right on the nose, make sure you've got that represented as 6.00 centimeters. And last but not least, we've got a graduated cylinder, so probably milliliters again. I got 43.0 mLs. Uh, so in all these cases, measure as far as the instrument allows and then estimate one place further. In this lab, we're going to be using volumetric glassware. So our volumetric glassware has this line etched on it. We call that a fill line. Uh, you've probably seen a volumetric flask before. You might not have worked with a volumetric pipette before. It's hard to see in this picture, but there's a fill line on the volumetric pipette as well. 
All of our volumetric glassware, both flasks and pipettes, are precise to the hundredths place. So this 100 milliliter volumetric flasks, uh, when you fill it to the fill line, has exactly 100.00 milliliters in it. Same deal with our 10 milliliter volumetric pipette. When it's filled to the line, you have 10.00 milliliters of solution or liquid present in that pipette. Uh, you want to make sure when you are filling it that the bottom of the meniscus is level with that line. Uh, if it's overfilled or underfilled, you can't really estimate if it's supposed to be, I don't know, 100.20 milliliters or something like that. It measures one volume very, very specifically. So something to keep in mind when you are working in the lab. All right, so now you know how to go through and obtain measurements or obtain data through measurements. Uh, so let's talk about counting significant figures. There are a handful of rules. You probably remember some of them. Um, we'll just review them real quick. Uh, so anytime you have a non-zero number in a measurement, that's always going to be significant. Things get a little bit tricky once you start working with the number zero. Captive zeros, or zeros that are sandwiched between two non-zero numbers, are always significant. So in those three examples, um, you have all the digits in each of those measurements as significant. They are captive zeros. They are in between two non-zero numbers. Leading zeros, or zeros to the left of non-zero numbers, are never significant. Uh, you see this most commonly when you're talking about uh, measurements that are less than 1. So in the number 0 0.0521, those two leading zeros are not significant. The 5, the 2, and the 1, of course, are due to the first rule. So there's only three sig figs. Uh, and that second measurement, all of those zeros are not significant. There's only one significant digit, uh, the, the number 3, in that second measurement. Trailing zeros, or zeros that are to the right of non-zero numbers, are only significant if a decimal point is present. So in the case of 1.900, both those zeros are significant for a total of four sig figs. If I take out the decimal point, that just becomes the number 1,900. All of a sudden, that number only has two significant figures. And finally, exact numbers have an infinite number of significant figures. And exact numbers are definitions, things like there are 24 hours in a day, or there are 100 centimeters in a meter. Um, those are correct to an infinite number of sig figs. You don't have to go through and try to figure those out. Uh, counting numbers also have an infinite number of significant figures. For example, if you're doing a titration and you've run it three times and you're trying to find the average molarity, um, use your data. Since it's an average, you would divide by three. You're not limited to one significant figure because you're counting trials, trial one, two, and three. Um, all this stuff makes a whole lot more sense once you're actually in the lab doing things. I know it's a little abstract just to think about the rules on their own. Pause the video and see if you can go through and assign or determine the number of significant figures present in each of these measurements. All right, the first one, hopefully an easy one. Only zeros really cause a problem. We see two significant figures. Um, and number two, the zero that is stuck in between the seven and the five is significant. The leading one is not for a total of four sig figs. All the zeros in measurement three are not significant. So you just have the three sig figs. The number or the measurement 400.0 meters, all of those are significant for a total of four sig figs. The measurement 0 0.004 milliliters, only one sig fig present there. Those leading zeros are not significant. Don't get tripped up with scientific notation. 2.70, we only care about the coefficient. All three of those numbers are significant. Number seven, all of those are also significant. Those zeros are sandwiched in between two non-zero numbers. Um, you've got five sig figs again for number eight. The lead zero is not significant, but the two at the end are. Four significant figures for number nine. The two lead zeros are not significant but the later two are. And in the measurement 500, you technically only have one significant figure. Um, there are going to be times where you need to express um, a measurement to more sig figs, and the way it's written right now is only one sig fig. And some students will go through and they'll like put a decimal point at the end of 500, and all of a sudden it's now three sig figs. That's kind of cheap, and you're not really supposed to do that. Instead, you're supposed to use scientific notation. So let's say you've got this gigantic graduated cylinder. You know the volume is somewhere between 500 and 600 milliliters. Um, so we know the hundredths place 
we have to estimate the tens place. So technically we should have two sig figs. So if I need to take the number of 500 milliliters and convert that into a measurement that expresses it to two sig figs, I can use 5.0 times 10 to the second milliliters. So we've got another really big graduated cylinder. Um, again, we've got 500 milliliters, but because we know the hundreds, the tens, and we are then estimating the ones place, we can go to three sig figs. Don't just add the decimal point. That's really cheap. Put it in scientific notation. Look like a professional. 5.00 times 10 to the second milliliters. Notice that numerically those are the exact same number. You're expressing 500 milliliters. Uh, but in sig fig world, those are two different measurements. So be very careful about that. Finally, you've taken your measurements. You now know how to figure out how many sig figs are in those measurements. You're going to have to perform calculations. Calculations have to reflect the precision of the instrument. So let's say you're going to try to find density. You zero it out. You find that the mass of the liquid in this Erlenmeyer flask is 29 grams. You pour it out. You find that it has a total volume of, I don't know, 36.2 milliliters. Plug it into the density formula. You cannot just go to any number of places after the decimal point that you feel like it. You are limited by the precision of the instrument, and there are rules that apply. Um, it turns out, for our class, there's really only two different rules that you need to know. One's for addition and subtraction, the other is for multiplication and division. So let's just quickly talk about those. Again, you've probably heard these before. When you're dealing with sig figs for addition and subtraction, um, it's all about how many places are after the decimal points. Um, so you're going to look at the numbers that you were either adding or subtracting, um, and based on whichever one has the fewest number of places after the decimal point, that's going to dictate how many places after the decimal point your answer can have. So if you've got 56 milliliters and you subtract 12.8279 milliliters, you're really just stuck with no places after the decimal point because of the 56. With multiplication and division, it is about how many total sig figs are present in each of your measurements. Uh, the one that has the fewest number of significant figures is going to dictate how many sig figs can be present in your answer. Again, this sounds kind of abstract, so let's look at some practice problems. Here we have some data. Looks like it was most likely obtained from a titration. So we're going to try to figure out the total volume of sodium hydroxide used, total volume of hydrochloric acid used. Uh, go ahead and calculate the molarity or the concentration of sodium hydroxide. And if we know the actual molarity of the sodium hydroxide is 0.090 molar, calculate the percent error. Give us a chance to practice with sig figs. So we're trying to find the total volume. We want to look at volume final minus volume initial. So I can check my data table and plug in 15.6 minus 0 0.28 milliliters. Um, when I do addition and subtraction, it's all about how many places are after the decimal point. In the first measurement, 15.6, I have one place after the decimal point. In 0.28 milliliters, I have two places after the decimal point. My final answer can only have one place after the decimal point, as that first measurement is the one with the fewest places after the decimal points. I end up with 15.3 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. Pause the video, try it for hydrochloric acid. Go ahead and plug the numbers in. We kind of run into a very similar situation as we had with uh, the previous example. I've got two places after the decimal point and one place after the decimal point. Hopefully you understand that the final answer can only have one place after the decimal point. So 22.7 milliliters of hydrochloric acid. All right, up next we're going to try to find the concentration, the molarity of the sodium hydroxide solution. You might remember this formula from Regents Chemistry. Uh, it turns out we don't want to use this one too often, but we're going to let it slide for the purposes of this tutorial. So plug in the information you've got. You know the concentration and the volume of the acid. You know the volume of the base. You're trying to find the molarity of the base. Uh, the way this is set up, we've got all multiplication and division. So here we're going to look at how many sig figs are present in each of the measurements. So I see two sig figs in point 055. I've got three sig figs in each of my volume measurements. I have to go with the smaller one. So my final answer can only have two significant figures present. Last but not least, and the most cal uh, complicated calculation from a sig fig perspective that you'll probably deal with all semester, 
percent error. Uh, so percent error, we always take the experimentally determined value and then we subtract out the actual or the accepted value, divide by the actual value, and then multiply the whole thing by 100. So we calculated um, a concentration of 0.082 molar for the sodium hydroxide. We were told that the actual molarity is 0.90 molar. So plug everything in. Uh, first thing we need to do is that subtraction. You end up with three places after the decimal point due to sig fig rules. So we get negative 0.008 molar. I'm going to then divide that by 0.090 molar and multiply by 100. When I look at significant figures, I've got one sig fig in the numerator, I've got two sig figs in the denominator, so I'm left with an answer that only has one significant figure. And the times 100 is actually a definition, that's the definition of a percent, so I don't have to worry about sig figs there. So the percent error in this case is negative 9%. There are more practice problems available on your sheet for you to practice with. Feel free to check your answers against the key that's been posted. All right, so just to recap, uh, significant figures are used to express instrument precision. That's not just a bunch of arbitrary rules that people came up with to confuse high school students. Um, it does serve a purpose. It is really important that you are communicating the precision of the instruments used. Measuring is going to be a huge deal in this class, as I've said a couple of times now. So you measure as far as the instrument allows, and then you estimate one more place. That's going to be the uncertain digit whether you are working with a fancy piece of digital equipment or you're using something very antiquated and old and simple like a graduated cylinder, the last place is always the uncertain digit as it's been estimated, either by the machine or by you. And finally, calculations, you have to pay attention to sig figs as well. If you've got calculations that require both rules, the one for addition and subtraction and the one for multiplication and division, you need to deal with sig figs after each type of calculation. Um, it can be tricky, but you'll definitely get the hang of it as the semester progresses. Hope this video was helpful, and don't worry if you're stressing out a little bit, you will get better with sig figs.